This is an intro to digital photography, quick run through exposure. The idea of this exposure lecture is to just give you the basic idea of what some of the numbers on your camera mean as we start adjusting exposure. As we get further on into the class, we will talk in much more detail about exposure and we'll start to really break everything down and utilize it in order to create the images we want to create. But for now, I just want you to have some familiarity and the ability to um, sort of make some decisions about what you're doing in your camera. So first of all, let's talk about exposure. When we say exposure in a camera, what we're talking about is the total amount of light that we allow to fall on the sensor during the process of taking a photo. How much light do we let in and what does that mean? So our camera has a meter in it and that meter wants to make everything what's called middle gray or 18% gray, which is really what we're looking at here in frame number five. It's metered the scene and it's read how much light is coming in and it's telling us in order to get middle gray, this is the exposure that it wants to get. Now, we can adjust that exposure to get different looks in our image. If we make our exposure less, like number four or even number three, then we start to make our exposure underexposed and we can make it feel darker and have a different, a different whole set to it, like it could feel more like night. But if we overexpose, like exposure six or exposure seven here, then we can start to make it feel more brighter and more like daylight. So we can really use exposure to make our image look and feel the way we want it to look and feel. But the camera is always gonna try to give us that middle gray. And so once we understand these numbers, then we can really make those decisions and start moving things around and making our images look exactly the way we want them to look. So what are the components that we use to make this exposure happen? Well, we talked about them a little bit when we went over the camera, and that is we have an ISO, we have an aperture, and we have a shutter speed. These three things balance out to create our exposure. So the shutter speed is how long this, the sensor will be exposed to light. It's a, an element of time. It's a fraction of a second or a full second of time. Uh, that we allow the shutter to be open to let the light hit the sensor. The aperture or f-stop determines how much light will hit the sensor. And that is the size of the opening in the lens. So the lower the number, the larger the opening, or the more light we let in. The, the higher the number, the smaller the opening, or the less light we let in. And then ISO determines how sensitive the camera is to light. So the lower the number on the ISO, the less sensitive to light it is, or the more light it's going to need to make an exposure. The higher the ISO, the more sensitive to light, or the less light it's going to need to make an exposure. So we balance those three things out. We have our ISO, our aperture, and our shutter speed. And each one of them has sort of an element that can be detrimental to it, can change the nature of our photo when we when we change this component so if we ramp our iso up too much then we're going to add noise to our image and adding noise to our image is going to look like grain or have sort of a sandy sort of texture to it noise isn't necessarily bad but we want to make sure that that if we don't want noise we don't have noise right so um if you need to show fine detail in your image, the noise is going to not be a good thing. The next one is aperture or f-stop, and that will affect our depth of field. The depth of field is how much or how little of our image is in focus. So if you want everything in focus, then you're going to need to use a higher number or a s smaller opening to get more things in focus. If you want less things in focus, you're going to need to use a lower number or a larger opening to get less things in focus. And then shutter speed will affect motion. So when we change our shutter speed, it will either stop our motion or blur our motion. And so we need to be aware of that as well. When we talk about exposure, we talk about things as a stop of light. It's a, it's a measure of light that we use, and we will talk about this all the time in class. This is the way that we quantify our exposure. 
is with stops of light. And the stops of light in each of the components, shutter speed, aperture, and ISO, are all equal to each other. Each stop of light is equal to each other stop of light. So when the aperture scale or the shutter speed scale or the ISO scale is moved one stop, the exposure is changed by a factor of two. This is called a change of one stop. When we say to open up a stop, we mean to increase your exposure by a factor of two, double the exposure. If we talk about closing down a stop, then we're talking about cutting the exposure in half. I talked about how math comes into play in photography, and here is the math. The math is times two or divided by two. So how does that work and how do we make that a thing? Well, here's what it looks like with apertures. So at the top of this image are full stop apertures. There are numbers that go in between these numbers that the digital cameras show you, but these are the full stop apertures that we're, that we're going to kind of talk about so that we can talk about it in full stops. So if I start off here at F2, um, we'll say that it is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 64 squares of light that are coming in. If I stop down one stop, if I go from 2 to 2.8, stop down one stop, I'm reducing the amount of light in half. So now I have 32 squares here. And if I stop down another stop to F4, I reduce it in half again, and I now have 16 squares. You can see if I go from 2 to 4, I've stopped down two stops, which means I've reduced the amount of light by one quarter, right? It's, it's a half each time. So we go a half, a half, a half, all the way down. So if I go one, two, three, four, five, six stops, I end up with one unit of light. So half of 64 is 32, half of 32 is 16, half of 16 is eight, half of eight is four, half of four is two, half of two is one. And if I go the other way from F16, if I open up a stop, I've doubled it. If I open up, I've doubled it again and again and again and again all the way up. It's half or double all the way through the scale. This works the same for ISO and the same for shutter speed. So this is how it kind of works. It's like the flow of water out of a faucet. So if I open up the faucet all the way, a wide open aperture, and it flows at two gallons a minute, and I want an exposure of two gallons, then my shutter speed, or the amount of time that I need to let that water flow, is going to be one minute. If it flows at two gallons a minute, I will need it to flow for one minute. If I close that aperture down one stop, or reduce the flow by half, basically making the volume that comes out half, then I'm going to need to change my shutter speed, or the amount of time that I fill the bucket, to two minutes because it's only coming out at one gallon a minute. And if I stop down one more stop or reduce the flow in half again, reduce the size of the opening by half, then it's going to take four minutes or a half a gallon a minute coming out of there to fill my two gallons. So that's how exposure works. It sort of builds up like that. And light works the same way. So you can see on the right side here that we have um, say, a wide open aperture of f4, and that means that the light can flow in for 1 1 25th of a second to get us our proper exposure. If I stop that down one stop or reduce the amount of light coming in by half, then I need to increase the time by 2. I need to double it. Twice as much time as 1 1 25th of a second is 1 60th of a second on our shutter speed scale. And if I reduce that amount of light coming in by half again, then I need to double my exposure again or go to a 30th of a second. So here are our full stop apertures. One would be wide open, as open as it can possibly be. The size of the opening is equal to the size of the lens. Everything else is a ratio of the size of the opening to the size of the lens. So 1.4 is getting a little smaller, 2 is smaller, 2.8, all the way to 22, which would be a very small opening. These are the numbers. There's math that goes with these. You can look up the math. It's, it's up to you whether you want to do that or not. Um, the math can be a lot. Uh, what I will say is that you can kind of remember it. If you remember 1 and 1.4, it doubles every other one. So 1, 1.4, then 2, 
then 2.8, and then 4, and then 5.6, and then 8. And then we have a truncation error where 5.6 turns into 11. It is what it is. These are the full stop numbers. These represent half as much light going this way, or if I start at 22 and go the other way, twice as much light with each number going the other way. Aperture affects our depth of field. The distance between the nearest and farthest objects in a scene that appear acceptably sharp. They may not be perfectly sharp, but they're going to feel sharp enough. So shallow depth of field means only a few objects are in focus. The distance between the nearest and farthest is very shallow. And deep depth of field means most of the image is in focus, or the distance between the nearest and farthest is very deep. There's a couple of other things that can affect our depth of field, not just the size of the opening, but a longer lens will have shallower depth of field, and the closer the camera is to the subject, the shallower the depth of field will be. We will talk about this in a lot more detail later in the semester. This is what depth of field looks like. So you can see at f5.6, the background is out of focus, the flowers are in focus. We don't change where the focus is, we're still focused on the flowers. And as we stop down to F8, more of the background comes in focus. And as we stop down to 22, even more of the background comes into focus. So that's what depth of field looks like. And you can see that with shallower depth of field, the flower becomes very important here and stands out nicely. And with deeper depth of field, some of the details of the flower start to get lost in the busyness of the background. Here are our full stop shutter speeds. These correlate with our full stop apertures. These are full stops of light. B is an uh, interesting setting on your camera and that stands for bulb. In other words, as long as you hold the button down, it will expose the sensor to light. But beyond that we have, we'll start at one second. Most cameras will go up to 30 seconds and these little tick marks, little quotes mean full seconds, not fractions of a second. So if you ever see a single number without these tick marks, that still means a fraction of a second. But in most cases, it'll show you um, the fractions on a digital camera. So we have one second. If we stop down one stop, it goes to a half a second. Half as much time, right? Half as much light. If we stop down, it goes to a quarter. Another one to an eighth. Here's that truncation error that I talked about in the apertures again. When we go from an eighth, it goes to a fifteenth. It's just the way that it works. These are the full stop shutter speeds. Fifteenth to a thirtieth, thirtieth to a sixtieth, sixtieth to a one twenty-fifth. That truncation error has now worked itself out and we're back on track. And so on and so forth to whatever your maximum shutter speed is. Some cameras will have a thousandth, some may have two thousand, some might have four, some might have one eight thousandth of a second. These are the full, shop, full stop shutter speeds. So how does that all look when we put it together? Well, here is an exposure at 1 500th of a second at f2. Now, when I talk about 1 500th of a second at f2, I can roughly describe the photograph not even knowing what I'm taking a photo of. So at a 500th of a second, I'm going to say that that's a fast shutter speed, so action is going to be stopped. If anything's moving in this frame, it is going to be frozen in place. And f2 is a pretty wide open aperture, which means my depth of field is going to be pretty shallow. So now I look at this image and I can say, I have shallow depth of field, the background is totally out of focus, and I have stopped the motion. I can see that these are pigeons. I can even see that they have feathers on their wings, right? We can see a lot of detail in this image. If we change the, show, the aperture to f4, so we've stopped down two stops from f2 to 2.8 to 4, that's two stops, or one quarter the amount of light, which means I need to let the light in for four times as long. So I went from a 500th to a 250th to a 125th. That's four times as long the light's coming in. So now at f4, more of the background is starting to come into focus. It's still relatively shallow depth of field. And at 1 1 25th of a second, motion is starting to get blurred. I can still tell they're pigeons because some of them are kind of standing still, but I definitely can't see the feathers on their wings. There's maybe a hint of it. If I was told that they were feathers, I could possibly make that assumption and kind of make that leap of logic. But at 1 1 25th of a section, second, the motion of the wings of the 
pigeons is starting to blur. So um, it it's relative to the motion of your object as to what is too slow of a shutter speed to capture motion. So now we go to F16. So we went from 4 to 5.6 to 8 to 11 to 16. That's four stops. So half as much, quarter as much, eighth as much, one sixteenth the amount of light, which means I need to multiply my, my shutter speed by 16. So I need to go from 1 one twenty fifth to a 60th, that's twice as much, to a 30th, that's four times as much, to a 15th, that's eight times as much, to an eighth, that's 16 times as much light. So now I have an eighth of a second at f16. My depth of field is much deeper. I can see detail in the background. And my motion is completely blurred. Except for this guy down here, I wouldn't know that these were even pigeons. There's just something going on in the foreground there. But if I didn't know that there were pigeons there before, I wouldn't know that there were pigeons there now. Because at an eighth of a second, we have effectively completely blurred those pigeons out of the photo. So this is what it kind of looks like. These are what we call equivalent exposures. These exposures are all equal. And so you can see that I've put up here the scale from F2 to F16, from a 500th of a second to an eighth of a second. And each one of these pairings is an equivalent amount of light. You can see that the amount of light in each of these images looks the same, but we have far different looks. This one stops the action with shallow depth of field. This one stops most of the action with less shallow depth of field. This one does not stop any of the action and has deep depth of field. So that is basically exposure in a nutshell. For your first assignment, you can kind of venture into manual exposure and kind of play with balancing these numbers out and see what you get. We will have an exposure exercise later in the, in the semester that will really deal with all of these elements.